All right, so good morning, everyone. Actually, good afternoon. We've got the Laurel Springs School here today, too, so I know we have students joining from all over the world, so wherever you're joining from, welcome in. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, and I think we might have some new kids today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. So in September, we ran our Backyard Bio Program, encouraging kids to get out to nature, exploring the wildlife near them. And one of the big things we heard from a lot of teachers is, man, we would love to get our kids more engaged, more active, figure out how to become great young naturalists. So here we are today with this really exciting and pretty unique presentation for us with Toronto Charity EcoSparks. They're right down the street from me. They do incredible work all over the general Toronto area and beyond in encouraging kids to get into nature, providing them with the resources, tools, and tricks to be more engaged in the natural world. And so I'm so excited to be joined today by Dana at EcoSpark. She's going to walk through with us how to be a young naturalist. So without further ado, I'm going to bring in Dana. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. Can't wait to learn from you and listen today and uh, take us away. All right. Thanks, Jesse. And thanks so much, everybody, for joining. I'm really excited to be here and to hear from some of you about what your nearby nature has and is, uh, is ready to go with us today. Uh, I know some of you are um, joining us from outside, and that's great. We're going to have some exciting uh, activities that you can do. One note, if you happen to have a shoelace handy or some piece of string, we're going to do a knot tying activity that I've used a lot in my job uh, uh, working in conservation and ecology. And we're going to talk about some bird watching tips and some bird feeders, all kinds of things. But let me just get started and let you know a little bit more about where we're coming from here at EcoSpark. So as Jesse mentioned, we're in Toronto and EcoSpark empowers people to take an active role in protecting and sustaining their local environment. We give people the tools for education, monitoring, and influencing positive change. What does that all come down to? I like to tell about this little guy. So I grew up calling this a roly-poly bug in Delaware in the United States. Maybe you've seen it near where you live, and maybe you have a different name for it. And if you want to open up your chat and go ahead and type in, if you know a name for this little critter, uh, you can add it in there. Turns out in Toronto, a lot of people call these potato bugs for some reason. Uh, you might notice if you poke them, they roll up into a little ball. Dana, oh good, and, you're going a little better. Sorry to interrupt you. You were had a weird feedback thing for a second, but you seem to be good now, so we're all set. And by the way, potato bug is a perfect name for those. Joe in Wisconsin also says roly poly, and I've heard uh, all sorts of amazing names for them. So keep on going. I just amazing. wanted to make sure you're on the connection. <laughs> okay, awesome. is the sound good now? You're perfect. Awesome, thank you. So a little secret about these, if you can believe it, they're not related to insects. They're not related to, well, those ants that you might see in the same spot underneath a log. They're related to lobsters. So if you can believe that, this is a little crustacean. Um, I love that they're, they're at home in the soil. They're at home in the water. You can find relatives of these all over the world, and this little type came from Europe and that's how we ended up with it here in North America. So I hope that today you'll, you'll take a moment to look around even the very, very small bits of nature close to you under your feet right now and we'll see what we can find and share with each other. So my favorite, the favorite um, part of my job is working with kids to discover little critters like that. Um, at EcoSpark we have two main programs with students. One of them is called Changing Currents and one of them is called School watch. So if you happen to be in the Toronto area and you're interested with your class and joining either in person in the field, we have adaptations for COVID-19 to make everybody safe, or we have remote sessions where we can come into your classroom and work one-on-one -on -one with you with activities to explore nature around you. Um, check us out at ecospark.ca and you can learn more about those programs and get involved. So what we work with and what I'm inviting you today to take a part and it's called citizen science. Citizen here means a citizen of the world. So we're, we're all about studying nearby nature together. You might think in your science classes, well, I've learned about hypotheses. You can ask questions about the world around you. And if you come up with the questions yourself, all the better. I've got a four-year-old and he likes to ask me questions all the time. What kind of bug is this, mom? Um, those are great scientific questions 
connections and a really good place to get started to learn about nature. The more that we share about nature that's near our homes and our schools, the more we can all learn together about local and global nature. So for example, if I see a bird up here in the wintertime and you see a bird in uh, the southern hemisphere in your wintertime, it might have been that that bird traveled all of that way to migrate. And so if we can share pictures, then we can learn more about what the bird species are doing. Let's take a look at how this works. By just right now, I'm going to ask you to look around where you're sitting, or if you're inside, think about somewhere that's in nature near you, right in your neighborhood, and share it in the chat. What is it that's special about that natural place? For example, um, I was at my kid's playground today, and I noticed there's almost a leafy rainbow because all of our trees are turning colors here in the autumn in Toronto. So if you can share in the chat, something about nature near you, then we'll share that with each other. And if Jesse, if you see any pop up, go ahead and let me know. Fantastic. So with Laurel Springs School, I know you guys typically are so good at not sharing on YouTube, but just sharing with this waiver. If you'd like to, you're welcome to in our private chat. Um, yeah. Uh, Let's see, Joe, Miss Wafer, you're welcome to share it. For me personally, I'm looking out my window now. I have a bunch of uh, Eastern gray squirrels that are black because we're here in Toronto. So we've got some really cool black squirrels all over the place running like crazy. And I've got an American Robin on my tree for good measure. So he's a little out of season. He's an odd butter, but um, so yeah, very, very cool nature stuff. If any of you have any other thoughts, please do share them. Go for it, what do we got on YouTube? Backyard, forest, lots of birds in the forest. Um, yeah. Excellent. All right, well, that's great. And I love that you have some examples there. You might know the names of the animals or the plants that you're seeing, but you, not, you might not, and that's okay. We can still share information about nature, even if we don't know what it's called. Um, so there's some really fun projects that we can get involved in with citizen science. And the very first way to start is to look around, notice something, and then ask a question about it. So just like my four-year-old said, what is this neat bug? You can look around now and think, I want to learn more about that. That's interesting to me. Um, if you're a class, you might do this together. So you can ask, how many birds can we find in 15 minutes uh, right from our school ground? Um, you can ask your family. So if you're at home, maybe ask your grandparents, your neighbors, what kind of birds did you notice uh, in your childhood? And then you can start to compare over time and space, see if there are any changes. Um, you can also, if you're in high school, you can turn this into a larger project and think about the, the nature that's near you and how healthy it is. So if you can identify invasive species, uh, for example, plants that are not native to the location where you are and that are causing problems there, maybe taking over, um, by flagging them for citizen science, using some of the tools that we talk about, that can really help with the conservation of your area and help promote biodiversity and the abundance of life where you live. So here in Toronto, when we think about biodiversity, we think about all the different kinds of wildlife, plants, animals, and critters that are, are sharing our home. So we're a very large city and there's a lot of people here in our area. But as you can see here from these local guides, we also have got tons of spiders, tons of mushrooms, things that you might not even think about when you're walking down a sidewalk that are sharing this space with us. That's really important to help us uh, have a healthy ecosystem here, healthy plants and animals that improve our air quality and take care of our water. And you can find local guides if you uh, look at iNaturalist and then type in your local area, you can find some um, uh, local species that others have pulled together so you can know exactly what it is that you're looking at. This word biodiversity you might be familiar with. I'm just gonna give a quick definition. Um, in Toronto, we've defined it as biodiversity refers to the variety of life on earth. It includes all living things and the ways in which they interact with each other. So what I really like about this, if you can see in the picture there, we've got a swallowtail butterfly on an echinacea flower. And it's not just that there are those two different organisms, the flower and the butterfly, but we see that the butterfly is visiting a flower and drinking the nectar. They're interacting together to, um, to further the ecosystem service of pollination and um, because of this interaction, then it supports a whole range of other wildlife in the environment. 
Okay, so it's not just how many things you might find, but what are they doing? What are they up to? You see some birds today, maybe ask a question about the bird behavior. Is the bird eating? Is it on the ground? Is it flying? Okay, so you can learn a little bit more about what those species are doing. Biodiversity is super important. So trick here, um, I found this image shared from NASA from, um, from outer space. Somebody took this photo and thought, hey, that looks like a letter. So if you can see what letter that shape of the river makes there, you can uh, take a guess why we're using it on our biodiversity page. Biodiversity supports clean water, clean air, habitat for wildlife, food and agriculture. So one third of every bite that we take as humans was pollinated by a pollinating insect at some point. Like if you've eaten an apple, at some point the apple tree had to be visited by probably a bee that helped that apple um, come into our food source. So that's amazing, okay? Biodiversity, all of this diverse wildlife supports us as well. Um, it's even important for protecting uh, cities and other places from climate change. For example, here in Toronto, um, we're protected from floods because we have a green belt, an area all around the city that helps to absorb all that extra water uh, that might fall in a really big rain event with climate change. So it acts like a big sponge around our city and helps protect us from flooding. Amazing. Um, even hum human well-being. I like nature. I know a lot of people do, but it's actually shown with research that if you're in the hospital and you have a view out your window of a brick wall, then you're not going to heal as quickly as somebody who has a view out their window of nature. Okay, so we know that nature is a really important part to keeping us healthy mentally and physically. Let's take a look at what biodiversity means for the littlest critters around us. These blue orchard bees are an example of native uh, pollinator. And this one works really hard. Only 250 of the blue orchard bee can do the work of 20,000 honeybees. All right, so if you have an, an acre of apples to pollinate, you just need kind of a handful of these little bees. Um, so that's uh, one of the benefits of biodiversity, having lots of different kinds of pollinators, for example. Some of them can do work that's really important, um, even in agriculture. So how could you protect them since they're giving us such a help with our food? Well, you can avoid pesticides. Pesticides are harmful for the bees that are pollinating our plants. Um, you can protect their habitat. How would you do that for a pollinator that likes flowers? Well, you can plant more flowers wherever you are. Plant flowers that are native to your system, to your ecosystem, and that will help the pollinators. So by planting those native plants, you support the pollinators. And guess what? Because the pollinators are healthy, you've got good biodiversity. That means that all the plants can have lots of good fruit. And the fruit is food for wildlife. So these black bears are so happy. They love to eat blueberries. The blueberries are there because we've supported the biodiversity with lots of pollinators, with lots of native plants and wild spaces. Amazing. So we're going to take a look at one project that everybody can participate in around the world. And this is free online. EcoSpark works with iNaturalist, um, but it's, it's just one of the many kinds of citizen science projects that you could take part in. Um, so EcoSparks iNaturalist page has some journal entries. If you're in Ontario, you can even submit to the EcoSpark page, link it up with your iNaturalist account. The whole idea with this is that if you have an app on your phone or if you uh, go onto their website at iNaturalist.ca in Canada or any of the iNaturalist uh, portals for your countries, then you can take a, a photo of something that's near you, maybe a flower and maybe that squirrel that Jesse was mentioning from where he's looking. You can take a photo of that plant or animal and share it. And then naturalists all over the world and other students and classes, they can learn more about uh, the nature that you're seeing and tell you even what species that might have been. So you can find out more about what you've seen. There are two apps that are really great for getting started. Um, iNaturalist has an app, but I'm also gonna mention Seek because Seek is an app that even kids 
um, under 13 can use. You don't need an account to have Seek, and this is good just for learning. So with Seek, you can take photos um, uh, and then just learn uh, what species are coming up um, by pointing your phone, for example, if you have the Seek app, you point it at a flower and it will use some uh, vision technology to compare with all the other photos of that similar kind of flower that people have submitted and let you know, well, I think that's a dandelion. And you can uh, learn more about it just by using the Seek app without um, creating an account. With iNaturalist, you can actually share those observations and start creating maps and wonderful resources to learn more about nature all around the world. So let's walk through just for a moment. If you can look here, this is almost like a clock. So if everybody sees the butterfly up at the, the top of the clock, then we'll go around and see what's involved in submitting to an iNaturalist project. First of all, you want to think about what you saw. So it might be something like a butterfly, or you might even know, oh, that was a monarch butterfly, those orange and black ones that we see in North America. If you um, can provide evidence, like a photo, then you don't even need to know the name of what it is because the community can help you identify it. So you will report what you saw. You will report when you saw it. Uh, it would just be the date and that's automatic on the app. It just pops up, it's super easy. And then if you have that photo, you can go ahead and add it right into your report. Um, where you saw it is also automatic with the app. So there'll be sort of a, a neighborhood circle that shows where your organism was identified, where you saw that butterfly, and you can change the accuracy on that. So teachers, you could set this for your whole school, for example, and maybe have a competition with the schools around you to see who's gonna find the most nature observations outside. Finally, with iNaturalist, you'll need an account, and teachers can create an account for the class. Um, there's a whole guide to that on iNaturalist, or you can email us at the end at EcoSpark to help get set up with a teacher account. If you're using the Seek app, um, you don't need to set up the account, as I mentioned, but there is a fun little add-on for Seek. If you can see, they have a, a, a monarch butterfly that somebody has observed here in the middle. And then as you submit observations, you get virtual badges. So you can earn badges for observing insects like this monarch butterfly, or if it was a crustacean, like that little roly-poly bug I showed you at the beginning that's related to a lobster, then you would get a crustacean badge, bird badges, all kinds of things. The more you see, the better. And that's just to help us learn more about all the wildlife that's around us. There are a couple other resources that I just want to mention because we're going to do some hands-on bird feeders today, and we want you to be thinking just a little bit further in your own backyard with these. You can think about um, reporting any birds that you see visiting your bird feeder. So some really great resources for that are eBird, which is all around the world. If you're here in Canada, you can also visit eBird or you can look at Birds Canada. Um, and this is one local field guide that um, we've pulled up in Toronto where you type in your address to Birds Canada and it shows you the 30 most likely species of birds that will come to your area. So then you don't even need to know the names of the birds when you're outside your school, for example. You can just color match and say, um, I saw a bluebird. Maybe it's our, our blue jays that we have here in Toronto called blue jays. So let's figure out the very first step of these bird feeders and a, a tool that I love because it's helpful in ecology and studying nature, whatever jobs you're doing outside, it's actually really important to know how to tie a special knot. This knot, even though it looks like bowline, you say it bowline, and the bowline is called the king of knots. Like people even made this sculpture of it. They love this knot so much. Um, the reason it's a great knot is because it's pretty easy to tie, but then it makes a nice loop that won't slip on you won't tighten up. Have you ever had a shoelace that you can't get untied because you tightened it up too much? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have any problems like that. And then you can untie it again pretty easily. So for example, at EcoSpark, we had an intern this summer who was studying insects on trees and she tied a bowl in to, to put the tags on the trees at every single tree, at every single tree in that park that she was looking at. And then she was able to take those tags off at the end of the project, just like a, a good ecologist. We always want to make sure if we're doing research, 
we're cleaning up the, um, the resources that we've put out into the trees at the end of the project. So after your bird feeders all done, after all the birds have eaten the seeds off of them, if you've tied it onto a tree with a bolin, you can untie your bolin very easily and get that um, uh, free again to save the tree from many strings that are tied tightly around it. So without further ado, let's learn how to tie a bolin together. If you brought a string, that's perfect, you can use it now. I want you to hold it up in your left hand. Okay, so hold it about a foot from the end, all right, in your left hand, just like that. And then if you can find maybe a chair leg or um, something that's up and down and stays still, we're gonna tie our bowling around that. So here I've got the stick. You might have been wondering why I had a stick. The whole time, we're going to tie a bullet around the stick. So you'll wrap it right around there. And then you're still holding the string in your left hand. Now, for the bowling, you need to make a loop. So with your right hand, you're going to make one little loop just like that in your string. Okay? And if you can see, it's almost like a backwards number six. Right? You want the loop to be that way so that the part that's hanging down is back behind, okay? Huh? Got it. <laughs> yeah, Jesse's working on the knot. That's great. I can't see you guys on the video, but I'm I'm gonna give you a lot of practice here tying your bowl in, and then we'll have a resource that you can take home with you to practice some more after the webinar. So in your left hand, you've got this short end, right? We're gonna name this one. We're gonna call it the bunny. See how it has like a little fuzzy bit there? Oh, definitely. And the bunny is gonna come up through the hole that you've made just like a bunny coming out of its hole. Okay, and then that part that's hanging down, that's the tree. And the bunny's gonna go around behind the tree. Okay, and back down through its hole. Right back through the hole that it came out of. So now you can look at the picture on the screen, you can look at mine, see if it kind of matches like that. And if you've got the bunny, you can hold its ears, you can hold its tail, and you're going to pull down on the tree to tighten your knot. Okay? So I doubt anybody could do that on the first try. I certainly couldn't. I've been practicing this for many years. Um, but I think that you can do it a few times, and we'll do it one more time together. And in the end, if you've got your bowl in, it's going to be a, a loop like that around that tree that won't tighten on it. Jesse, how you doing? Are you tied up? I'm pretty, no, I, I messed it up the first time, like you said, but I'm trying my best here. And I think I'm using the diagram now. We watched you first. And yeah. Now our kids are all trying to, I can see them and they look. So Joe, Elliot, way to go, guys. Miss Wafer, maybe you're trying to, who knows? Uh, <laughs> That's <laughs> great. It's a hard nut. And so I'm really, I'm giving you all thumbs up for even trying it. We're going to go through it just one more time here. And then if you haven't had it yet, don't worry about it at all, okay? Thank you for trying, and you'll have that picture uh, that you can practice with later. So one more time, you can look at the picture while we do this. You're gonna hold it up in your left hand, okay? Put it around something, like a stick or a table leg, okay? Make that loop in your right hand like a backward six. <laughs> Take the short end, that's our bunny. Remember the bunny comes up out of the hole, around the tree and back down through the hole. So let's see that. The bunny's gonna come up through the hole, back around its tree, and then back down in through its hole. Okay? So now you've got a bunny with the ears and the tail and you can pull down on the tree to make it tight. All right, well, you all are really good sports. Thank you for trying the bowl in. Make sure your string's not anywhere getting lost. You can put it aside. We're gonna do a little bit more uh, with that in a minute. Awesome. Dana, you asked me to mention that we're at the 25 minute mark. We've got plenty of time. If you wanna keep going, dive in with more stuff, we'd love to hear from you, so. Perfect, all right, we'll wrap up in just two more minutes here. Thanks, Jesse. Um, so just a real quick note that uh, people all over the world are using knots like that in their conservation work. Like here in Toronto, you might tie a knot up uh, to hang mist nets and catch wild birds in order 
to put those bands around their legs and learn more about them and then let the birds go free. So you might see some birds near you. We have all kinds of different birds. Here you can see some have fat bills, some have skinny bills. And the diversity of birds are supported by lots of different food. So if you have a chance to make a pine cone bird feeder at home, we're not gonna do it all right now, but I'll talk you through it. You just take a simple pine cone or you can even use a toilet paper roll. You're gonna roll it in some kind of nut butter, okay? Something plain, unsalted. Um, you can even use uh, like a vegetable spread like Crisco, okay? And then sprinkle it with seeds. So you can use real bird seed, any kind of seeds that you have. So all of that's gonna get sticky and yummy all around the pine cone, right? All the peanut butter and seeds stuck inside there. Then you'll tie your string just like we practiced around the top of the pine cone and hang it up outside from a tree or balcony. Yeah. And then you've got something that's really handy nearby that you can see if there are any birds that come and visit and submit them to the citizen science projects like iNaturalist or look at them with SEEK. Okay, something else you can do is to plant uh, uh, some native plants, all right? There's lots of guides and EcoSpark can share them with you for your area of local native plants that are great if you're thinking about doing a garden at your school. This will support biodiversity. And then those two things together, the bird feeders, birds that you might just see, anything that comes to visit your plants, or if you go for a nature walk, anything that you might see, if you, if you turn a log over, for example, all of that uh, good wildlife that you're finding can be submitted to iNaturalist or one of the citizen science projects, and you have helped out with promoting biodiversity. So stay involved. Uh, you can check us out at ecospark.ca and we'll share around some of those resources. Uh, we've got e-newsletters. You can donate or volunteer. If you're in the Toronto area, we'd love to hear about your nature data. And thank you so much. Thanks, Jesse, for hosting us. We'd love to take some questions and hear about nature near you. Fantastic. Well, thank you so, so much. Dana, if you want to come out of screen share so you can see us again, I know it's kind of weird to not be able to see everyone trying their knots, uh, but way to go to all our, our classes and families for being such good sports. Um, Laurel Springs School, if you want to share your questions with Miss Wafer, we're going to come to her in a second and take a whole bunch from you guys. If you're on YouTube in general, you can share questions there. And for Joe and Elliot, we'll come to you guys in just a second. So many, uh, so much great information today. We're going to share those resources with classes after the fact too. So thanks so much for tuning in, everyone. All right. Miss Waver, we're going to kick it off with you. Uh, again, Laurel Springs School International in Scope. Uh, if you want to share some questions with us, go for it. Okay. Well, I will say that Morgane, who is in uh, Minnesota, and Emily, um, I can't remember where Emily is, um, all, and Sam and Harry all tried. They're on camera in the room. We have students nice. around the world. They all were trying the knots as I was. So I have a question from Damien, who's in San Diego, and he's in eighth grade. And he heard that if you get a bumblebee just right, that they will let you pet them. Have you ever <laughs> pet a bumblebee? That is a wonderful question, Damien. I'm so glad that you're watching bumblebees. Um, I will tell you that uh, I happened to work with bumblebees very closely when I was in graduate school. And so I had the chance to pet bumblebees, but I had a lot of training and I learned how to do that just the right way. Bumblebees, believe it or not, they do have stingers. So they're reluctant to sting. They don't like to sting. They're not dangerous. Um, but I wouldn't recommend that you would go and, and give them a big hug and squeeze, uh, especially if you don't know which one's which, because some of them do have stingers. Um, but you can definitely learn more about bumblebees and a great way to do that is to take a photo. You can get pretty close to take a photo of a, a bumblebee because they get pretty uh, excited about the flowers they're visiting and pay more attention to that. Um, okay. So that's a great way to kind of get up close, uh, figure out which ones you've got. You can submit to iNaturalist or look up which bumblebees you have with Bumblebee Watch, some other great projects out there. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, Damien. Yeah, and for me, so it, over uh, September, we did our backyard bio program, and all the best insect photos I got were of bumblebees because they got really into the flowers, head tipped in. You can get really close to the great camera. So we hope to have some of your pictures on the EcoSpark iNaturals page on ours 
on Twitter, just share them everywhere. Share them with your friends and family. We'd love to see your bumblebees. Awesome. All right, let's go to Joe joining us in Mount Oregon, Wisconsin. Joe, if you have a question for us, and I know you do, go for it. All right. So I don't have a question, but huh. right now, but I do live on a big farm, and I've seen a bunch of cool things. Like I've seen mice and snakes and. Nice. A bunch of other things. That's amazing, Joe. Thank you for sharing. Can you tell us one thing that you saw today on your farm? Hmm. Any, uh, creature? <laughs> any creature outside? Have you been out yet? No. I no. Well, maybe maybe something will come up to you and, and you'll find something by the end of the day. That's a challenge for everybody, all right? Maybe you can look out the window and see what's happening today. All right. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing, Joe. Binoculars. Yeah, Joe, that was great. If you do have questions, let us know. Uh, what we'll do now is go to Elliot. So if you want to demute your microphone uh, at home, come on up and ask a question or share what you've seen. Anything you guys want to share with us. You're good to go. Uh, I was just wondering, what do you do when you find a dead animal or a dead thing? What would you do with it? Yeah. Wow, that's a really great, great question, Elliot. And it's true, when we're out in nature, sometimes that we can see the full life cycle, right? So if you're a scientist like me and you're thinking about all of the questions that we have about nature, then it might be a, another chance to study something, right? So another thing that's probably not good to touch, but you can take a picture, even of something that has already gone and, uh, and learn what species it was. And then that's evidence, right? So unfortunately, sometimes we have roadkill in Ontario, um, but there are scientists who are studying which, which animals are most affected by roads. And then they were able to put up barriers along those roads where they were uh, getting the most problems with cars hitting animals. And now the barriers are protecting the animals. So the, the uh, snakes and turtles hit the barrier and they go a different way and they don't go onto the roads anymore. Um, so thanks for that great question. And I hope that you'll keep, uh, keep your eyes open out in the, the wide world there. And what a great segue to a really cool project to help save wildlife. So thank you for that, Dana. Um, all right, Ms. Wafer, we'll come back to you. Uh, if you have more questions for us, go for it. I do. I have a, I have a couple of questions. The kids were really paying attention to your photographs. And Emily, who's in Austin, Texas, wondered if she saw a tag on one of the butterflies in the picture. And then Morgane, who is in fifth grade in Minnesota, wondered where the picture of the black and white warbler was taken when you showed the photos. Ooh. Amazing, wow, that's a great attention to detail. I didn't notice that the butterfly had a tag. I'll have to go and look through. All of our photos, or almost all of them, came from iNaturalists, so the citizen science projects I was telling you about. And a lot of them are submitted by community members, by kids. We get a lot of um, people in our projects who are submitting photos all the time. Um, so the tags that she was mentioning, if you hadn't heard about this project, people are trying to learn more about butterflies and they found a way to put a little tiny kind of sticker about the size of your pinky finger onto uh, monarch butterflies and other butterflies. And then if the butterfly is captured in a different place, somebody could read the, the number off of that sticker and realize that that butterfly has traveled from point A to B. And now we, we know more about the migration of that insect and where it might find its habitat. Um, so that's a, a nice way uh, to have um, a harm free research study. You don't have to actually injure the butterfly. Um, and you can learn more about that. Um, Monarch Watch has some information on that if you would like to learn more about the tagging. Um, and then uh, I don't remember the location of that particular uh, warbler that somebody had mentioned, but we could certainly look it up for you. So uh, you can email me at Dana at ecospark.ca if you have more questions or want more resources after our talk today, and we'll be sharing them by email. Thanks so Fantastic. much. Fantastic. I put your email on the screen. Always a dangerous Perfect. game to play because you might be invaded by the end of the day, but uh, thank you for sharing that with us. And yeah, for students that are really keen on monarchs, uh, we've done several projects on uh, or talks on the monarch butterfly migration, some of the most popular things we've ever done. So Greg Mitchell and Alana Wilcox both did beautiful talks on monarchs, talking about some of those tags if you want to follow up. All right, Joe, I see you have a question for us now, so come on back in. Go for it. What, what's your favorite animal to study? Ooh, Dana, no pressure. Favorite animal to study, you said? 
Oh, yeah. that's a great question, Joe. Well, to tell you the truth right now, I'm pretty curious about those roly poly bugs, those <laughs> ones that we were looking at in the beginning. I didn't realize that the ones that live near me were actually introduced from Europe. So I have some questions about that. I want to know how they got here. I want to know if anybody thinks they're causing any problems um, because they didn't evolve here um, and how they might re react with the um, or have interactions with the native species that are living here. Uh, so that's my question of the day, I think, is those those potato bugs. Joe, what do you call them? Do you know that kind of bug or yeah, uh, critter? Tons of them. And I, I call them roly poly or pill bugs. Or pill bugs. All right. Yeah. Cool. And now we all know they're not bugs. <laughs> they are. So, so, by the way, one of the coolest things about them, because they're one of my favorite things I ever learned about nature as a kid. So they're crustaceans. So crustaceans have to lay their eggs in water. And what they'll do, wood lice, will grow like a segment, fill it with water like a little pool, and lay their eggs inside it. So they have like a separate segment of their body where they lay eggs inside themselves. Like it's just mind blowing. And then the bottom of the ocean, wood lice can get to be like this big, like over a foot and a half to two feet long. You can look up giant isopods, is what they're called when they're on the ocean floor. Um, and around the world, what do we have? As we were talking about this the other day in a program. Potato bugs, boat builders, butchie boys, slaters, chuckle pigs. Chuckle pigs is my favorite, I think. <laughs> Crunchy bats. I mean, they're very strange names. So wow. share those. Thanks. Jesse, I didn't know that. That's amazing. There you go. And I know our, our students that are looking in streams near us, too, are finding those isopods in the streams. Ah. So even right here in this one spot, we can find them under logs or in the water. Amazing adaptations. They cool. certainly are. We did a Banff National Park macro invertebrates in the water. People don't think about bugs in the water. There are some crazy things that live in your local streams and ponds. Go out there with a net if you can, a jar, and see what you find. There's some really amazing stuff. Awesome. All right. Uh, Elliot, come on back in. If you have another question for us, man, I uh, just demute that microphone and you're good to go. And if you don't, that's okay too. But if you do, you're muted right now. You got to unmute your microphone. I can't do it from here, unfortunately. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> um, yesterday I was at a place called Arosha and they were re, uh, they were like rehab like getting habits back to the way they were supposed to be. Nice. And doing things. I was just wondering if you've ever been there before. Yeah. That's amazing. I haven't been to that location in particular, but what you're talking about, that activity of helping to make nature healthier, that's something that we can participate in all over the world, okay? Unfortunately, where we are, where humans are living, that's often some of the impacted areas, right? It's not as wild as places where humans haven't had those big impacts, but humans can make a huge positive change. For example, if you have access to a park or your schoolyard or even your own yard, you can be planting flowers that are native to the place where you are and that will support pollinators. Um, if, if it's fall where you are, like right now here in Toronto, you can take care of your yard in a way that helps pollinators by leaving some of those dry leaves in a pile maybe because as the, um, the insects are getting ready for winter, they've snuggled down into those little leaves and into the stems of the plants. And if you take all of that off of your yard, then they won't be able to survive the winter and come back to your property next year. So that's a really good tip for rehabilitation. Thank you for sharing that, Elliot. Yeah, fantastic, guys. By the way, we've uh, we've uh, opened up a can of worms, Dana. We've got people that are testing out Seek on their cat already, so that's very exciting. Now get out and explore some wild creatures, but Seek is Pokemon Go for nature. It incentivizes nature exploration. You get mammal badges, bird badges for finding things, so it's the coolest app. I love iNaturalist too, so hopefully you all get a chance to use that soon. All right, um, Miss Wafers class, if you guys have a few other questions, go for it. I also wanted to say I'm not usually outdoors and I want to thank you for allowing me to be outdoors today sure. during this event. I felt it was um, applicable today. And I'm here in Kentucky actually. And uh, we had a couple questions about invasive species. I know here in Kentucky, the kudzu vine is an issue. And um, Harry was saying that he has caught an invasive fish before. So our question mm. is, you know, maybe talk a little bit more about that, maybe in your area or just in general, what kids can look for in their area when it comes to invasive species. 
That's a great question. Thank you for joining outside. We love that. We love that you can see right around you what's there. Um, so wherever you are looking for, for species, you can think a little bit more. Remember I was saying you can ask a question to learn more about what is that species. And one thing that you can do if you're submitting something to iNaturalist, it'll give you a little flag there to say, hey, this looks like it might be an invasive species, a species that doesn't belong. It can be a plant, like you were saying, the kudzu vine in a lot of our southeast states in the U.S., um, causing major problems um, because it takes over, right? Like the trees and the plants that are um, that are very happy there with those soils and, and that climate condition, they can't take full advantage of the place where they are because kudzu is in the way. It's taking over. It could also be an animal. You said you might have caught a fish that's an invasive species. Well, if you took a photo of it with iNaturalist, then people could confirm whether or not that's an invasive. And that might be a really important thing. Maybe they didn't know that there was a fish that shouldn't be in that lake yet. And when you submit your photo to iNaturalist, now they can say, hey, we should check out over there and make sure that nobody is uh, transporting by accident fish from one place to another um, or having any, uh, any further transmission of those species. So just to clarify, not all species are bad, even if they're not from that location, but if they're causing problems like taking over an area, um, then that's called an invasive species. And we wanna try and, and limit that and protect our healthy ecosystems for biodiversity. Yeah, what a cool question and not one I expected in this broadcast. So thanks, Ms. Wafer students. Yeah. So amazingly, time flies when you're having fun together, Dana, and we're nearing the end of the broadcast. So what I want to do uh, is really quickly share some of the things that you've talked about today. Uh, iNaturalist, again, I encourage everyone to use this. We've been using it at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. It's an incredible resource. It's going to be the heart of our Backyard Bio campaign in May. So I really hope you guys get a chance to download that if you're a teacher. You seek if you're under 13 and talk with your classroom and see if they want to get involved too in sharing observations of wildlife near them. Uh, in the Toronto area, we have this amazing biodiversity series. So Dana showed a little bit of that with mushrooms um, and spiders. I have all the biodiversity series in my, my personal library. It's incredible. It applies to a lot of creatures in Ontario and beyond as well. So check out the Toronto Biodiversity Series. And then most importantly, ecospark.ca. You can learn more about all the amazing resources, tools, and tricks they have for getting out in nature, encouraging you to be more engaged with the natural world. So hopefully you get a chance to do that the moment you're done this broadcast. And with that, Dana, is there any last message you'd like to share with us about your own experiences in nature, what kids can do, what you want them to take out of this session today? Sure. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Jesse. My final tip is this stuff, popcorn. If you ever pop some popcorn, you can thread some on a string, and that makes another really great impromptu bird feeder. So you can make a string of the popcorn kernels and put it outside and see what comes to visit. Um, and then maybe have a snack on your own too. All right. So everybody, thank you so much for looking around. I hope you'll take some time today to look outside, uh, submit some observations of nature to citizen science, or just talk to your friends and family about what it is that you're seeing. And thank you, Jesse. We look forward to seeing you next time. Awesome. I can't wait. I'm going to get out and explore some nature myself. Joe, hopefully you get a chance to get out and check some nature near you. And as uh, you guys all know, all our speakers uh, or all our, our viewers today, what we do at the end of every broadcast, I'm going to bring in Miss Wafer, Joe, and Elliot. If you guys want to join me and say a huge thank you to Dana for joining us today. You are all in. Thank you so, so much. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>